why don't we get started. Before I proceed with the introduction, I want to announce uh, things that are happening tomorrow, continuing in the Institute. Lecture tomorrow at 12 noon is entitled Culture and Crisis in Central America by Alberto Salamanca Castillo. And that will be 12 noon in the Pioneer Room. Then at 8 o'clock, it will be Democracy and International Security, The End of History Revisited. And that's by Francis Fukuyama. That's the 8 p.m. in the sunroom. And it continues on Thursday. And I would ask that you pick up a brochure on your way out. Michael Parenti received his PhD in political science from Yale University in 1962. He has taught at a number of colleges and universities, including State University of New York at Stony Brook and at Albany, the University of Vermont, and Sarah Lawrence College. He was a guest professor of political science at Howard University from 1987 to 1988, a guest professor at the University of Canterbury, New Zealand in spring 1989, and a distinguished residence professor, professor at California State University, Northridge, in spring 1990. His books include The Anti-Communist Impulse, Trends and Tragedies of American Foreign Policy, Ethnic and Political Attitudes, Power and the Powerless, Democracy for the Few, Inventing Reality, The Politics of the Mass Media, The Sword and the Dollar, Imperialism, Revolution, and the Arms Race, and, the poli and Make Believe Media, The Politics of Entertainment, which is, came out in July 91, that's what it says here. His articles have appeared in The Nation, The Progressive, Political Affairs, American Political Science Review, Journal of Politics, among others, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, Science and Nature, Harvard International Review, Massachusetts Review, In These Times, the list goes on. He has lectured widely on college campuses and before religious, labor, community, and public interest groups around the country. Among, many, among the many topics he has spoken on are, one, democracy and economic power, imperialism, the arms race, and U.S. interventionism, inventing reality, political bias in U.S. news media, democracy, revolution, po and popular struggle, and most recently, the Gulf War, U.S. globalism and the New World Order, and super patriotism and militarism. So now I'd like you to help me welcome tonight's lecture, Mr. Michael Franklin. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. Uh, my thanks to the people whose organizational efforts made all this possible. Um, I wanted to say something about communication universe, begin with that, and maybe even say something about culture if I could. A speech, ideas, information, images, as you know, that's all the stuff of social intercourse, it's what we use when we talk, but those are also the resources of social control and hegemony. Much of political debate and much of political struggle is really a struggle over who controls the labels, the terminologies, and the images? Who gets to call whom an extremist or a terrorist? Uh, and who gets to call whom a, a leader um, and a good guy, if you will? W.I. Thomas, the American sociologist, once said, if people define situations as real, then they are real in their consequences. So reality is often the definition that you can put on events and such. If people decide that Saddam Hussein is a demon, a mortal threat to their security, then they will act or support actions that are very real and consequential. A demon is attacked, or his nation is in any case. He's still quite alive and in power. Uh, <clears throat> but let's take that example again. How did the public come to that conclusion about Saddam Hussein? How did the images and attitudes emerge to sustain and make popular a, that, that particular war? Although, by the way, the popularity of that war, I think, was greatly exaggerated. 
much of it was really a get behind our, our boys kind of thing. Well, there's a culturalistic analysis. It says, well, it's something in our culture. Or we pursue demons because we always did. We've been doing that since the Salem witch trials. Or we're violent. There's a frontier quality to America. We're gun nuts. We have more guns, more gun shootings than anybody else. Or it's macho and machismo. Or we're racist and ethnocentric, so we can stereotype other peoples very easily and then kill them and go out and bomb them. No hesitation to destroy third world peoples of color. We've been killing peoples of color since 1492 on this continent. Or we're jingo patriots and we wave a flag in our faces and we'll do anything. So it's all part of our unfortunate heritage. I'm speaking from a premise that that war was a bad venture and killing all those people wasn't really a good thing. Well, without denying that there are those strains and attributes, I find such explanations insufficient because they're anchored in an imperfect understanding of what culture is. Culture is not just something that's around, that weighs on us, that is sort of some abstracted mystical force in our heritage. So that's the media. They always they, they take pictures when you start to gesture. You know? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> you could talk for five minutes, but the minute your hand goes up, they'll be, then the flashes start. <laughs> That's okay. I don't want to. You, you got to make a living. Go ahead. Um, culture isn't just that thing out there that makes us do things because well, I did it because it's in my culture to do it. Uh, I mean, to be sure, much of culture, the mores, attitudes, values, laws, languages, artifacts, practices, standards, are so long-standing, they're so widely diffused as to feel almost self-generated or uh, abstract, uh, 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 you know, as if they are reified, self-generated forces that act on us. But mo must, much of culture is consciously generated. It's orchestrated through a social system. Culture just doesn't exist. It has to be mediated through a social structure. That is, you have to get it through patterns of social relations. Family, schools, there are people who are living in certain structured relationships who mediate that culture to you. <clears throat> and that social structure is also a class power system. Not just a class structure, but a class power structure. In other words, it's not just a, by, by the difference between class structure and class power, by that I mean there's a lot of literature in American social science on class which really treats class as nothing more than, than a demographic characteristic, a, a, a function of income, lifestyle, upper middle, lower middle, uh, blue collar, white collar, occupation, and class is seen as these stratified uh, life modes. And there's a lot of literature on that, correlating class with <coughs> consumption patterns, with the marriage patterns, or this, that, and the other thing. But I'm talking about class power. Class power means that there are some people who have a relationship to the resources of society that is quite different from yours and mine. That is, they own the resources of society. They occupy the positions of influence. They become the secretaries of state and defense and national security council leaders and U.S. presidents, or they pick the people who pick the people who nominate those guys. They are the bankers. They are the boards of trustees of this university. They are rich, conservative business people. They sit on the, they own the banks and the factories and the mines and they, and they uh, control the museums and many of the churches and the universities and the colleges. And they are, they are elected by nobody. They are self-appointing. When a third of them, uh, their term is retired, the other two-thirds co-opt another third in and they draw them from that same social class. They are what's called corporate America. They have control of the wealth of the country, the labor, the technology, the markets, and they control the institutions, and they control the information of the society. 
In other words, corporate America controls most of those social institutions that mediate our cultural images, our information, that sets the social and political agenda, along with corporate government and the state. So it wasn't our frontier heritage, or our machismo, or our bully tradition, or our can-do impulses, or our messianic impulses that explains the war that was waged in the Gulf, or in Vietnam, or in Grenada, or in Panama, or against Nicaragua, or against El Salvador's liberation forces. These impulses and attitudes and traditions may be enlisted, they may be incited to be used for that particular policy, but it doesn't explain that policy. It doesn't explain why we attacked Iraq rather than, say, attack repressive, brutal Saudi Arabia. Let's say we are patriarchal, machismo, frontier, violent, whatever else. Why didn't we attack Saudi Arabia? Why did we attack Iraq? Would we have attacked Iraq if it produced broccoli instead of oil? <clears throat> Why didn't we attack Syria when it went into Lebanon? Or Israel when it went into Lebanon? Or Turkey when it invaded Cyprus? Or Indonesia when it invaded East Timor and killed half the population? Why suddenly Iraq? So you can't really explain a, a policy from the cultural heritage or the theme, themes that are often brought up as to why we are <clears throat> the way we are. Most Americans had never heard of Saddam Hussein before August 1990. What there was was a conscious and massive government and media propaganda campaign to create the demon, demonize him, call him the butcher of Baghdad, the madman, and all that, and to create a consensus. Much of politics is the manipulation of irrational symbols for rational ends. And that's a very important point, because many people see the irrational components, but quite often, and certainly our media pundits and many of our academic analysts, overlook the fact that the irrational components operate and are directed toward rational ends. They serve somebody's interests. They're not just there. What we hear is that there are tribal conflicts in South Africa, for instance. And, it's, it's, and, and the picture that comes to us is of a very irrational thing, a bloodletting that's going on. But in fact, those seemingly irrational um, events are, are very rationally financed and targeted for very specific ends. They have very real polit specific political goals, which is to undermine the African National Congress and to destabilize it and do a whole bunch of other kinds of things. Nazism is an irrational goose-stepping. But Nazism served some very real functions for some very powerful interests in Germany and in Europe. And all the literature talks about who supported the Nazis and not enough literature talks about who the Nazis supported after they came into power. There's some very specific things they did for the German cartels and the German bankers, the non-Jewish ones, and, and for the, um, the property class of Germany. I'm doing a study of the Spanish-American War, and everywhere I read that it was, a, it was the outgrowth of a popular hysteria in America to go fight Spain, uh, activated by the yellow journalism of the press. There was no popular hysteria in 1898. There was no great clamor, and William McKinley very consciously planned that war. I came across, a, in the Navy War College, I came across a plan, what to do when we go to war with Spain, written in 1896, two years before the war ever began a year before McKinley took office. We would attack the Philippines, we would occupy Puerto Rico, we would do this thing. Very consciously, specifically planned. And very real interest, J.P. Morgan and others, consciously saying we need markets in the East, Spain's colonies are plums to be plucked, let's go do it. There were people who knew what they were doing. And just because some of the liberal critics don't know what the power elites are doing doesn't mean that the power elites don't know what they're doing. Anti-communism is just a phobia, a McCarthyism, a hysteria that people just got frightened. There were reds everywhere and all that. It wasn't a hysteria at all. It wasn't activated by hysteria. Its goal was to create hysteria in the populace and fear of communism. But the people who activated that anti-communism had very specific goals, had very specific political intentions, which was to purge the labor union movement, 
um, intellectual movements, academia, and so forth, of any kind of dissident opinions. And they went about their business very systematically, and they knew what they were doing. So they may have been crazy, but they weren't stupid. Richard Haas, special assistant to President Bush, attached to the National Security Council, in today's Washington Post, says that television was, quote, our chief tool during the Gulf War in selling our policy, unquote. He goes on, the administration wanted things framed in simple black and white terms that could be explained very quickly, unquote. So what I'm saying is that much of our culture is self-generated. It brings unexpected consequences, the new developments. It has uh, uh, reservoirs of tradition. Uh, new social formations come up, the people can generate new issues. We just see that with the whole issue of sexual harassment breaking through. But much of our culture also, I'm also saying that much of our culture, a growing portion of it, is fabricated, incited, and controlled. Much of our discourse, almost all our public discourse, is prefigured by the power of money, organization, and institution. I'm not saying that those with money and those who control the media control your opinions and your mind. They, don't, maybe, they do not control what you think, but they control a lot of what you think about. I mean, we are thinking about and talking about things that come up in the news all the time. We think about a lot of other things, but they often don't get, dis get visibility. In fact, sexual harassment is a very good example of that. There have been millions of women in this society who have not only been thinking about sexual harassment as an issue, but have had to live it and suffer it and endure it. And you didn't see a word. You didn't see a word in the public discourse of this nation, in the national discourse. It was only when a young woman came up in front of the committee and 25 million people happened to be watching and she said certain things this, 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 and, and then suddenly the thing broke through and was heard in the national media. But there's a reason. There's, not, there's, no, there's no reason why you couldn't have had important uh, issues and interviews about that long before. <clears throat> Karl Marx said oh, well, over 160 years ago, I know Marx is supposed to be irrelevant, but he's very relevant to what's going on, he said, in every epoch, the ruling ideas are the ideas of the ruling class. That those who control the material means of production control the mental means of production. Because the mental, all mental activity needs a material base, I would add. That's me, not Marx, but I mean, he wouldn't disagree with that. Um, the, 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 fact, the fact that we can have a mental reproduction right here, a discourse about issues and ideas, is only because there's a certain material base that allows us to be here, that brought me here, that, that's allowed you to be here, uh, and the like. The news media in, in this country, the news media are not part of corporate America. They're not close to corporate America. They are corporate America. They are an integral entity. The, 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 the boards of trustees of the major networks are staffed by representatives and directors from the major banks and major corporations in America. Uh, NBC is owned outright by General Electric. And you can go on. Uh, the major newspaper conglomerates also are cartels which are owned by very rich people. <clears throat> About eight or nine giant corporate conglomerates control just about uh, all the um, media in this country. I'm talking about all the mainstream media. There are little newspapers, little handouts we have right here, uh, which aren't owned and controlled by them, and which suffer the problem of lack of material means to, for mental reproduction. That is, they suffer the problem of not having enough money to send, to send out mailings, to reach new readership audiences and, and the like. And so they often are always teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. They don't have a huge amounts of money from corporate owners and from corporate advertisers. There are two functions for the, that the, the media have for the, for, the, for the owners. One is to make a profit. And the second is to maintain the conditions of continued ideological hegemony. 
to make sure that these newspapers, uh, these media, do not allow for the kinds of opinions, some of which you heard you hear in this conference this week, or what you'll hear tonight. I mean, you don't get on the media on any regular basis. I mean, I've been on national media once in a while. You have one right wing, you hear one right wing here, and they're both screaming at you, and you can't finish the sentence. And, and then they can say, you see, you've been on. A, it's a free country. We even allow a lefty like you on the media. Um, these giant multinational corporations, by the way, also control the world's media, not just the U.S. media, but the world's media. Uh, there are third world nations that get more information on Liz Taylor's eighth husband than they do on the political economy of the country right next door to them because the media conglomerates are so owned and preempted by these giant multinationals. In fact, when a, a group of third world nations tried to form a uh, a, a new information order, you know, um, to, to have alternative media. I mean, some of these countries only get information about their own backlands. They get more stuff about what's happening in Paris or London or Lisbon or Washington than they do. Um, when they tried to form a new information order, th this was branded by the existing media conglomerates as ideological. That is, the challenge to ideological monopoly is always branded as ideological. They assume they're not ideological. They assume they just give you the news. <clears throat> um, what I'm also saying is that class power is exercised by specific controls. In the case of the media, those controls are several. The first is government control. By the way, all discussion on censorship and the media and how free is our media and are they going too far and do they get at the truth and uh, 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 are they limited in what they can do, almost all the discussion about our media has to do with the media's relationship to government. And that's a real, that's a real thing in the sense that um, government does control information and sources. Government actually has control of the lifeblood of media, which is information. And if you're in the White House, um, press, if you remember the White House press corps, you learned that if you write things that are too consistently critical of what Mr. Bush does and says, and you point out his inconsistencies or this or that, uh, you learn that you, you st your phone doesn't ring anymore and you sit in your little office. You don't get sources, you don't get leads, or you get leaks and they're wrong leaks. Uh, choice assignments go to those who know how to get on the team and work with the team. While there's an awful lot of talk about this conflict between government and media, <clears throat> I would like to point out that the real burden, that, that in fact the clashes between government and media are much less than the whole areas of cooperation. If you have any doubt, just look at the Gulf War. When that war began, the US media became a cheering squad and talked about how we are doing and isn't this terrific and everything's going fine so far and so forth. They spoke with a, an identity. I, heard, I remember hearing uh, Jim Lair on McNeil Lair saying, well, has the public been adequately prepared for this war by the press and by officials? And I thought, what a fascinating statement. What a fascinating omission. Sometimes they say a little more than they intended. Has the, government, has, the, has, has the public been adequately prepared for this war by the press? Now, if you heard a Russian say that, you'd say totalitarianism. <laughs> the press being used as an instrument of government to manipulate the people. But here you had Lair saying, concerned, have we done a good enough job in preparing the people for this war? Is that what your job was supposed to be? I thought it was to be critically detached and objective and, 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 and not join the war effort. To be sure there are conflicts. The conflicts are such that the media, in order to maintain its credibility, does at times have to report on things that government doesn't want reported. I mean, if George Bush had his way, there'd be nothing in the newspapers about recession, because there is no recession. You heard him recently, didn't you? He said, the recession's over. The White House staff has said, we're coming out of it. Light at the end of the tunnel. 
There's no recession. So if they had their way, there would be no articles about recession, no articles about toxic waste dumps, no articles about uh, uh, homeless, no articles, and, and, and it would be just, it would be, your newspapers would consist simply of celebrations of the wonders of the free market and the horrors of communism and, uh, and then a few crossword puzzles and cooking recipes and comic strips. And, a few. and by the way, a lot of newspapers in America do resemble just that and are pretty much that. But, there, but most of the media, to maintain its credibility, has to deal with certain actualities at times. To the extent that they deal with those things, even if it's only to soft soap them and slide over them and finesse them, uh, to the extent they do that, they often will come up with bits of information that are very annoying to the White House. So it's like a maestro with a symphony. This is the analogy I used in my book, Inventing Reality. <clears throat> the maestro with a symphony, everybody is playing in perfect orchestration to what he wants. Every note is just the way he wants it. And then there's the discordant note. Now, what's going to get his attention? Is it going to be all the people who are playing perfectly, or it's the discordant note? So every so often, there is that discordant note, and the president or some official gets irate and says, uh, that is a not, not true, and that's an unfair story, and all that. And it gets the media off the hook. It leaves the public with the impression that the media are indeed an independent watchdog, and they are fighting back, and there is a conflict between government and the press. The media are not a watchdog. They're not exactly a perfect lap dog either. They are what I said, a house pet dog. They kind of run over and they'll nip endearingly at the master's ankle and, and then flatten their ears back and wag their tails. It didn't really mean it. It was just a little nip. And, and they'll do that every so often and yap a little bit and be a little troublesome. But for the most part, they're a pet. A frisky, feisty little pet sometimes. Not quite a lap dog. There are other forms of media control that no one ever talks about, that have nothing to do with government. And that's the kind of control that's exercised by the owners of the media themselves, and the advertisers, and also the diffused political culture that's created, the dominant field of information and political consensus that, that's created by the media itself and has its own feedback effect. And those are the things I'd like to talk about. Let's take the owners. Rupert Murdoch was asked recently, quote, as a political conservative, to what extent do you influence the editorial posture of your newspapers? And I thought he was going to, I thought Rupert Murdoch was going to give the usual blather, you know, the, which the Gannets always do. When they, every time they take over another local newspaper, they say, oh, well, we are ed editorial independence. The newspaper, you know, we have professional standards and all that sort of thing. Rupert Murdoch is, as a, as a press mogul thug, he's, he's kind of honest. You know, one thing you say about certain kinds, of, kinds of, bu of financial buccaneers who are out there just raping the world for as much money as they can get out of it, they, they're kind of honest. You know, they, they're like the mafia. They don't pretend that they, they're in, they're in the, uh, public health service work. They, they tell you what they really are doing. And so Rupert Murdoch responded, to the question, to what extent do you influence the editorial posture of new your newspapers, he said, considerably. The buck stops on my desk. My editors have input, but I make final decisions. Nothing unequivocal there. He also said, please don't call me a mere conservative. I'm a radical conservative. And that means he's out to change things in a conservative direction. Otis Chandler, by the way, one of the better publishers in the newspaper world, publisher of the Los Angeles Times, he admitted there's an ideological selection process. Quote, I'm the chief executive, I set policy, and I'm not going to surround myself with people who disagree with me. In general areas of conservatism versus liberalism, I surround myself with people who generally see the way I do. So, C. Peter Jorgensen, I'll just read you one more quote. He publishes the Century Newspapers chains out in the Northeast, um, three Boston area weeklies. And this is what he said to his editors of all the weeklies. Quote, I do not intend to pay for paper and ink or staff time and effort to print, n this is a memo, to print news or opinion pieces which in any way may be construed to lend support comfort, assistance, or aid 
to political candidates who are opposed by Republican candidates in the November election. You are specifically instructed to submit any and all political stories which mention any candidate in any campaign, in any photographs, letters, editorials, cut lines, or any other kind of written material whatsoever relative to the election or elected officials and their record to the publisher prior to publication. If this is unclear in any way, resolve every question in your mind with a decision not to print, not in capital letters. Now, there's no state censor who could be more thorough than that. The thing is, that goes on all the time. It goes on, actually, with a set of anticipatory responses. It's not that often you can get your hands on a memo where the guy says it quite like this. I have another one from Joseph Pulitzer, Jr., who said to his editors, uh, lay off Joseph McCarthy. I want no statements of Joseph McCarthy in the following weeks on the editorial page again, blah, blah, blah. Very specific instructions. They do come up again and again. <clears throat> Another group of the advertisers. Todd Gitlin asked a number of network bosses, do the advertisers influence what you do with, on, with the media? And again, I thought you'd get the usual blather, which is, well, there's a pressure, but we have our professional standards and we have autonomy and we decide what we want to do and all that. And they said, oh, yeah, you betcha, all the time. Yes, sir. Herman Keld of CBS, he asked, do our advertisers and their affiliates ever taken into account in programming decisions? And he said, quote, I would say they are always taken into account. Always taken into account. That's his repetition, not mine. Um, so nothing, not unequivocal, nothing unequivocal, I mean, uh, nothing equivocal there, quite unequivocal. Um, <clears throat> Salzberg, a publisher of the New York Times, very explicitly told his staff, you must never publish a story that is critical of the automotive industry. This was back, you know, about um, 30 years ago when there was this young lawyer in Washington public interest lawyer, nobody ever heard of him, he wrote a book called Unsafe at Any Speed about how automobiles were dangerous and all that, called, his name was Ralph Nader. Well back then, Salzberger up to then and even after uh, would not publish, even into, even into the 1970s, would not publish anything about the issues of automobile safety or auto pollution. And why? He very explicitly said because it would, quote, affect the advertising. The automotive industry was responsible for about 18% of the Times' auto revenue. In other words, the largest chunk of any particular industry was auto. It was their biggest advertiser. And you can go on with the way magazines have trimmed on uh, tobacco and cancer stories and all sorts of other things like that because of who their advertisers were. But advertisers, by the way, will cancel ads not only when the re reporting reflects unfavorably on their own product or industry, but even more often, more frequently, they will withdraw their accounts because they dislike the liberal biases that they think are creeping into the news. A friend of mine, George Stefano, wrote an article on uh, Grenada, what was happening when the New Jewel movement took over Grenada and what was changing there uh, and how it was helping the common people of the country. Uh, for the New Haven Advocate, and Macy's Department Store canceled its account with the New Haven Advocate. Now, Macy's Department Store wasn't being maligned by an article in Grenada. Um, uh, it wasn't hurting their trade at all. It was very simply, they didn't like the politics of that. The business viewpoints are very abundantly represented with TV shows like Nightly Business Report, Wall Street Week, Adam Smith's Money World, and all the others, all of which have corporate backing, both on the networks and on PBS. The, nation's, uh, the country's most far-reaching wire service, Associated Press, is also its most conservative and is owned by big companies like Merrill Lynch. Um, <clears throat> besides the news, you have to look at news commentators, uh, the columnists, the editorialists, the uh, commentators on TV. They are overwhelmingly either right-wing or centrist. There are no progressive, really left progressive uh, perspectives allowed. What you can get is a Pat Buchanan, who's far right, and a Michael Kinsey, who represents the left. Michael Kinsey writes for the New Republic. As he himself said, I'm nowhere as far left as Pat Buchanan is far right. 
There is a whole other dimension to the political spectrum, a whole other perspective which habitually gets excluded from the media. That e that's even true when there are v various kinds of events. The Exxon Valdez oil spill. Overwhelmingly, the sources, the people who were interviewed were Alaskan officials, Exxon uh, corporate executives, and, uh, and a few other local people. Uh, there was, there was in, in case after case, I mean, I didn't do a systematic study, but pretty much um, there has been a study, and I can't remember which, which one it was, but it showed that not, not a single spokesman, or maybe only one or two spokesmen from environmental and ecological uh, organizations were ever tapped. Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting did a study of the sources used by the major networks in the Gulf War. They were almost all military sources. There was only one person from a peace group out of about 300 that they looked at. Um, the working press, it's very interesting when you talk to reporters and such, they don't, uh, most of them don't really agree with this, they're, they're, they're full of congratulatory stories. I, mean, I, I was just on a panel with a group of them in uh, Dayton, Ohio last week and um, I, I knew what was going to happen. I told the people who organized it, I said, oh God, why didn't you put a couple of other people give me some support? I said, oh, there'll be a difference of opinion. I said, no, they they're all going to be there and they're all going to be doing this and talking about what a great job they do and it's a tough job and you've got to understand and this and that and the other thing. There are some reporters, you can find some. They're usually ex-reporters, they're usually people who have left the field, <laughs> who will say, oh, you, you're checked all the time. You're always under control. You have to have very finely tuned antenna uh, to tell you how far you can go and you can't go any further than that. And the, and the controls are often informal. Uh, someone will say, oh, we've covered this. Uh, or you're getting a little too close to your story. That's a phrase used, meaning if you're writing stuff that's getting troublesome for the powers that be. Uh, yeah, you're getting too close to your story. Or, uh, well, I don't know, the old man is wondering, are you get, getting to be a cause person? Are you, are you losing your objectivity? Just a little a phrase or so is brought in now and then. A little hint is handed out to you. And reporters worry. They worry about this. Other reporters, in fact, I'd say most of them, unfortunately, don't worry. Most of them get very indignant if you suggest that there's a controlled system. I don't know why they think it isn't controlled. Just every other profession is controlled. Every other organization, you've got to watch what you say for the boss. They actually think, plenty of them think that they get indignant. They say, are you trying to tell me that uh, I'm not my own man? I'll have you know that in 14 years with this newspaper, I always say what I like. And my answer is, you say what you like because they like what you say. That is, if your ideological perspective is perfectly coterminous with your boss's, perfectly congruent with his, then you're not going to have any sensation of suppression because you'd never go far. I mean, if, if you have a leash around your neck but you always sit by the peg, you will not have any sensation of restraint. It's only when you, it's only when you stray to some forbidden parameter that then you feel the tug and you're, and you're pulled back. And these are guys who never stray, who never have a different vocabulary. Take one who does have a different perspective. Aslan Humbarasi. Who's Aslan Humbarasi? Well, he used to be a correspondent for the New York Times, the most prestigious newspaper in America. And he wrote about Turkey. And because his efforts on Turkey met with systematic hostility from Turkish officials, and from the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. military mission in that country, he finally resigned. But worse than that, he complained, it was the Times itself that gave him the worst problems. Quote, when it was not completely, what, I mean, he means his, it meaning his reporting. When, let, me, let me read this way. When my reporting was not completely suppressed, it was cut, re rewritten, buried somewhere in the back pages, or distorted if it did not happen to fit in with State Department policy." Unquote. In his letter of reg resignation to the Times, Humbarasi writes, the suppression of civil liberties in Turkey, the brutal treatment of peasants by a ruthless gendarmerie, the police terror in the towns, 
the revolt of the peasants in remote Anatolian villages, the arrest and imprisonment and torturing of political prisoners, the persecution of intellectuals, the scandalous abuse by officials, the official support extended to the extreme right wing, have found no place in the columns of the New York Times. That is, the expose of these horrible things are nowhere in the New York Times. He resigned from the New York Times, by, by the way, in 1949, and the Times coverage of Turkey hasn't changed since. I could go on. I have a whole set of examples of reporters who, um, who resigned. John Barger and his buddy, whose name I forget, Associated Press reporters who did these series of stories on the CIA's involvement with the cocaine and drugs and, uh, and guns trade, how their stories were savagely cut or suppressed or little pieces were brought in or rewritten totally, and how they finally quit in disgust. Um, on and on and on. Uh, people who write or cover labor often quit. Uh, if they try to give a fair shake in, in labor disputes, they find their stories rewritten and cut. And reporters worry about that. They worry about having their copy cut. They worry about getting it rewritten. They worry about getting reassigned, pulled off and sent off into some journalistic Siberia, you know, to go cover City Hall or back. Ray Bonner, the, one of the best correspondents in Central America, who was yanked off the story because he reported the atrocities by the Salvadoran, U.S. supported Salvadoran military against the villages of Moras province and broke that story about a thousand people massacred, yanked off, the, yanked off his beat in Central America and stuck away on the financial page until he finally quit. And I can give you a case after case as I say, I don't want to talk all that time and to do that. Um, let me just give you one recent one, an additional one. John Alpert, an NBC stringer. Now, John Alpert had worked for 12 years as a stringer for NBC, had filed over 100 stories. He returned from Iraq during the Gulf War with very revealing footage of civilian areas devastated by U.S. aerial attacks. NBC News President Michael Gartner not only refused to air the film, but terminated Alpert's uh, relationship with the network, fired him. <clears throat> Len a Ackline, a Chicago Tribune reporter, notes, quote, reporters think twice about delving into sensitive areas. They worry about being removed from choice beats or being fired. That system whereby you fire somebody because they write something you don't like, that is called suppression and censorship. And, that's, and that goes on all the time. Um, Nicholas Johnson says there are four stages in how these reporters finally make their peace with their profession. First, the, he says, stage one, the reporter uh, comes up with a story. He writes it. It's an interesting expose. It's got some things in it. He submits it to the editor, and he's told that the story isn't going to run. We don't want it. Can't use it. He wonders why, but the next time he's cautious enough. Before he writes the story, he checks with the editor first. And he's told by the editor that it'd be better not to write that story. That's stage two. Stage three, he thinks of an investigative story, idea, but doesn't bother the editor with it because he knows it's silly. And stage four, he doesn't even get the idea anymore. And I would add stage five, he appears on the panel with media critics and gets indignant when they suggest that he's censored in any way. You know. So what I'm saying about the censorship of the Gulf War, it was true the military censored the war, but most of the censorship of that war was done at home, was done by the media itself, in, in the issues it would not investigate, in the ideas it would not look at, in the information it would not handle or touch, in the photographs of mutilated bodies it wouldn't show and all that. That was what's so spectacular about that one evening on CNN when Peter Arnett showed the bomb shelter bomb where you actually saw, you actually saw what, some, what, what our bombs were actually doing to other people. Um, that's an unusual thing. Well, I think I've just pretty much covered it and I think you got the ideas. I have another whole bunch of things I wanted to say about the entertainment media because I just wrote a book on that, but I think I've been going too long here. Um, let me just say that the same thing is true about the entertainment media. Uh, I decided to write a book about entertainment media because even though I'm political and I'm really involved with uh, U.S. 
uh, domestic policy, foreign policy, and how the media distorts those things and all that. It occurred to me that 90% of the media isn't about the news, especially the broadcast media. 95% of it is entertainment. It's this other stuff. It also occurred to me that you're being more than entertained when you watch that stuff, and that's the theme of the book. When you sit down and watch a Rambo movie, you are getting racism, sexism, imperialism, uh, a glorification of militarism, and it's all woven into a subtext of action that keeps you there watching rather uncritically. You see, when, you, when you're listening to somebody talk about the world, a commentator like myself, you at least consciously know that I'm making an argument to you. When you watch one of these movies, you don't. And it's amazing how many people use these movies as, as guides for role model, life guidance, um, as authoritative references. Um, you'll hear people say, well, it was like the guy in that movie, this and this and this, so he did that, you see? And then someone else says, oh yeah, I see what you mean. They take things from the movies become uh, the guides, and it gets a little...